Hello and welcome to the Data for Subscriptions podcast. I'm your host, Berat Banyan, and today I have the pleasure of welcoming Thomas Grönkis to the show. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you very much, Berat. Great to be here. Let's start with an introduction of yourself. Yeah, where should I start? Uh, I was a former uh, professional cyclist in Italy and uh, were competing all across the world against famous cyclists like Lance Armstrong. And uh, when I retired, I thought I'd never want to see a bike again. Um, But living in Stockholm, I got stuck in traffic jams, stressed about making it to meetings and also start gaining some weight. So I thought this is not sustainable. So uh, I did something drastic. I sold my car and I bought an affordable, simple bicycle. And uh, yeah, that bike uh, became my go-to choice for most of my city travels. And uh, I also uh, realized why I once fell in love in cycling because that sense of freedom that a bicycle can give you. Uh, But I also faced a lot of problems. So uh, uh, when the bike was broken down, uh, I need to take it to some uh, uh, mechanics and fixing it was always a hassle. So I thought for myself, is there a better way to do this? And is there a market for this? So that's when I started to discover uh, the start of Mio. Really cool. We're going to get to Mio in just a minute, but uh, if you don't mind, I want to go back a little bit to the yeah, why not? part of why your not? career yeah. as a professional cyclist. How many years were you uh, racing as a pro? I uh, rode six years in totally. So uh, I uh, lived four years in Italy and two years in uh, Monaco and Monte Carlo. And what years are we talking about now? Oh, way back in time. So I did my last season 2004. So how do you view professional cycling today? Because a lot has happened since the days you were racing potentially because it's about 18, 19 years. But at the same time, many things look the same because the racing still bikes and Tour de France is still happening, mostly at least in France. What's your current view? Uh, The thing is, uh, at the moment, I'm not following professional cycling at all. So uh, as as I said, I converted to a keen commuter cyclist myself. And then uh, lately, the last two or three years, I've been catching up with some gravel biking. And that gives me also back the the joy of cycling, coming closer to nature, uh, not being around the cars and everything. But uh, I think you have uh, more uh, you have more control of the professional bunch today. I know the first two or three names uh, winning Tour de France and so, but it, it's not that I'm fed up. If I if I start to look at the bicycle race, I can still feel the joy and, and uh, watch it. But it's not like I'm following what's happening on the tour or anything like that anymore. No, that's uh, correct. That's a correct observation of myself. I really enjoy uh, cycling. I try to do that a little bit uh, on my own as more of a hobby. And I do follow the professionals. It's fascinating in many ways. But to attach to what you were saying in terms of your interest for gravel riding and the bridge a little bit to what you were talking about, how you came back into cycling, it's interesting to see that cycling has really exploded in many different directions. One, which I appreciate myself as well is gravel and because it opened up during the pandemic, it made cycling more accessible for more people who just wanted to get out. Yeah, I think it's really important because it helps with just uh, mental health as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a big uh, thing to improve your status of uh, a human, I would say. Uh, As soon as you are on the bike, you cannot feel any pain from anything, either if it's uh, physical or mentally. It's it's a way to get out there, clean your head and uh, be prepared as a human, I would say. So... And then if we look into specifically using the bike as a tool to transport oneself, which lends itself to your idea of starting Mio, which you'll soon introduce uh, for us thoroughly, it's uh, fantastic to see 
uh, as it's growing, because many years ago we used to talk about uh, Copenhagen specifically yeah. and Denmark being the icon for cycling, but we can see that things have shifted. Here we both live in Stockholm, in Sweden. We can see how it's evolved. Perhaps it's not at all going as fast as we would like to, but if I compare today versus 10 years back, since yeah. we both have been commuting for a long time, it's a significant difference because today the bike paths that have been built and expanded, they hold a lot of people on them. Yeah, in fact, it's incredible to see uh, how uh, cycling as uh, transportation are growing, not only in Sweden, but everywhere. And we could see like really boom during the COVID times. And you can see cities like uh, Paris or uh, Berlin or um, even Milan was doing a great effort to improve their status of bicycle infrastructure and uh, that all together with that you were supposed to avoid public transport was uh, giving a really a boost for the cycling commuting i would say i think many would agree with us it's a great thing to improve just health in society it's also great from an environmental perspective so with that let's talk mio uh, tell yeah. us about mio yeah, so uh, Mio, it's all about making cycling convenient, safe and fun. And uh, we have an app and platform where we gather services related to everyday cycling. So uh, you can buy services like uh, uh, maintenance at your doorstep or uh, anti-theft protection service book for your bike and uh, we're also implementing more and more kind of gamifications to make encourage more cycling and uh, make it more fun it's a subscription business that you started a few years ago it's not just i mean you started from the avenue of simplifying bicycle maintenance but yep. you're growing from there adding more and more perspectives and value gamification we should come back to that's an interesting thought we touched in a way about uh, the gap in the market because you explained yourself how you felt when you started to use your bicycle as a yep. commuting device. But can you explain a little bit more what gap there is in the market that you want to fill? Yeah, so what we see is that uh, buying a bicycle online is growing every year. Yep. And uh, the prediction is that 20, 30, 40% of all bikes are conducted online and uh, you cannot physically fix your bike through internet right so you need uh, partners to build up the infrastructure for aftermarket and service and today uh, the thing is that you go to a traditional bike shop where they both sell bikes and do bike service but since the competition from those e-commerces uh, creates uh, a challenge for uh, the bike shop owners to keep their margins, to uh, have a profitable business, uh, then we can see more and more uh, bike shops is uh, closing. And that is the, the gap that creates between the bicycle manufacturers, bicycle sellers and the customers. So what we want to do is to uh, uh, get into this gap and to help uh, customers getting even a better service than they did before when they had to go to the bike shop. How does your offering and pricing structure look like? Uh, as of today, we are offering uh, one-off services. So you can buy uh, different services as uh, on demand, uh, buying a puncture, buying swapping tires, which we're doing here in Sweden or fixing your gears. Uh, and then we have uh, created a subscription model. So uh, you are always first in line to get your support from us. And you also get uh, benefits like discounts on the one of services that we are offering. And what's the price for the subscription model? Uh, you pay uh, 1000 Swedish crowns equal to uh, like 100 euro mm -hmm. per year. Mm -hmm. And then we cover your basic service two times a year we give you uh, puncture insurance so uh, we always keep your bike rolling and then we also include uh, an insurance in case your bikes get stolen 
uh, and then uh, of course the discounts. So if you need to change your gears, uh, like if you want to change change chain and cassette, for example, which you need to do on a regular basis, yes. then you have discount on on those kind of products. So it's fairly complex because you have already bundled in certain value and attributes. Yes. And then you are providing discounts on maintenance parts yes. that naturally come from partners because you would have, not that we need to go too much into cycling nerdery, but Shimano or SRAM or whatever yeah. it might be. And then this in, it's interesting because you also have an insurance against theft, which is a problem. Yeah. And then you're connected to obviously an insurance company. Yes. That's a pretty complex offering, I would say. Um, it, it's It's definitely one that... I can see how you've taken the customer into consideration first. What's a great yes. experience for them? Yeah, but then it creates a fairly complex backend, if you will, to manage this. Yeah, it's it's both complex and simple. I would say today we are working uh, together with an insurance company for Sweden that is totally digital. So mm -hmm. it was uh, fairly simple to uh, implement uh, their service in our uh, subscription. Uh, and then uh, we, we also see the benefits of uh, bundling a lot of services to create uh, value for the subscriber to actually subscribe. So we see all the pain points that cyclists have. I can just refer to myself. The worst thing was uh, one day when I went to get out, get my bike and someone else did it before me. So uh, things uh, that is both improving safety for your bike and yourself, but also that it's make your bike life really smooth. Yeah. So you know that you can be on, on wheels uh, directly instead of getting your bike into a bike shop and realize it's uh, two weeks of uh, waiting time and then get and pick up your bike again. We want to like overbridge all kind of problem that you have as an everyday cyclist. And let's go there now because you have a, I really like your proposition and you kind of hinted to it. And since I know that you have the bike buddies and all set up. Yeah. So let's touch the customer angle now. So the concrete value for customers subscribing to you naturally is at the highest level, a pain-free and simple, smooth bike life, I call it. Yes. Your bike works. Yeah. When you need it, yeah. if it stops working, you get immediate help. And I want to actually stress immediate because I know even for me, who is at least can fix a few things on my bike myself, is that if you try to take it to a bike shop, it's not necessarily so that you can get help immediately. And plus the hassle of if anybody has tried to transport a bicycle to a bike shop, that in itself is not trivial either. And especially nowadays when a lot of people in Stockholm are like me, don't have any car. So you need to rely on uh, th that you can transport your bike in some, some kind of way to the bike shop to get it fixed. So it's problematic. Yes. And you talked about the ecosystem when you spoke about your offering, but let's talk about the bike buddies that you have. Yeah, yeah. our great, great heroes. Um, so uh, what I realized a few years ago was that most of the problems of the bikes are pretty simple fixes. It, it's uh, punctures, it's basic service, uh, tune-ups, stuff like that. And uh, what I could see was that there is a lot of great people out there know how to fix those minor issues. So uh, what we have created is a platform for if we call them bike nerds or bike buddies that are really into cycling, they really like uh, products and the bicycle itself. And uh, they can work with anything like today we have, uh, we have uh, doctors, we have teachers, we have uh, tech consultants who are supporting us uh, and on their free time, mainly like evenings and weekends, they are matched by our app to go out and fix those minor issues. So that's kind of our first line support. So instead of you having a puncture, need to put your bike in the car, go to the bike shop, they can fix it on the place 
on a time when you decide the bike to be fixed. And then if you have some major issues, then you can go to the bike shop because the bike is working, so you can pedal it over there. And then you can have it fixed uh, properly there. Right. And the bike part is naturally because they come to your home for your convenience. Yeah. So again, repeating what you said is you can, through the app, you can alert and find and book a bike buddy that exactly. lives in your vicinity, person comes to your home, yeah. make sure that your bike either gets completely fixed depending on the issue yeah. or gets it fixed well enough so you can then more easily transport yourself to a bike shop. But you can also, the whole bike shop experience is already also managed through the app. Yeah, so uh, we have the entire, um, it, it's uh, possible to book a time slot in the app for a bike shop as well. So uh, we are both doing collaboration and then uh, in Stockholm uh, as a pilot, we are setting up our, our small own hubs. And then uh, on top of that, we also have a mobile bike servicing car so we can go out to customers and fix it if, they, if, if, if we need it. Now, but this is truly so. fantastic. Of course, one can claim I'm a little bit biased because I'm a cyclist myself, but frankly speaking, just looking at it purely from a business perspective, it's so clear how you've thought about the complete, let's say, customer experience chain here to the extent of all also looking into when you want to get it to a bike shop that you also facilitate that part of the process. Yeah. Let's talk about the bike, but it's a little bit more. So how do you actually acquire the bike buddies? Can you sign up yourself uh, by just joining Mio by downloading the app and how does that work? Yeah, today uh, today you can actually download the Mio Bike Buddy app and sign up. And uh, the process is that we first of all uh, dig into your interest of, of bikes. And then we, of course, have some uh, uh, tasks to fill in to see if you are uh, good enough. Yeah to do this and then you have the opportunity to try together with another bike buddy and they can prove that you are uh, good to go. So that's one way uh, how we today, because today we have efficient enough of bike buddies in Stockholm, for example, so we're not, uh, uh, take, we are not uh, doing actively uh, acquisition for new bike buddies, but if they are coming news, we're super, super happy. Uh, and what we did in the beginning was that we we could see that it was uh, fairly easy to get traction of new bike buddies because, uh, uh, and, and that was also part of why we created this, because we could see that the behavior behavior was already there, like neighbors who, who helped other neighbors that were not so into cycling and they could help them. So uh, in the beginning, we were uh, just having some digital uh, marketing campaigns and uh, uh, were doing some activities in some forums. And then we were, so that's been the e easiest part, I would say, to gather those great people working together and then to keep them keep them happy and in the system we also make a lot of uh, community activities so on um, friday saturday now we are making a bike ride and we have already like 40 persons signing up for that specific gravel ride together and uh, we can see also uh, on uh, our um, communities uh, like on the platform how they are engaging with 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 each other uh, if someone is facing a problem with a customer or with their own bikes they are sent out the question and immediately they have like 30 responses how to fix this and what to buy to to make the bicycle work again and stuff like that so we have created something that is really beautiful to see the engagement and the willingness to help other people to come up on their bikes. And at the same time, we can also build a business around it. So I would say, uh, I think like Airbnb had the same kind of early adapters when it right. comes to the supplier side that are really engaged and uh, supportive to to build this. Yeah. And the, and the bike body aspect of your business is more the gig type approach, meaning that they're not necessarily employees of Mio when you vet them and you bring them on board, yeah. they get paid for the specific service that they provide. Yes. 
So uh, the difference with, with us compared to like gig companies, I would say that the people that we attract to become a bike buddy, they have their uh, daily bread and butter already right. settled by another another work or if they are studying and then they are doing this on the top of everything, right. get, getting rewarded per, per gig. Right, yeah. understand. Very good. Let's talk a bit more about the um, the ecosystem beyond the bike buddies because you also sell through a partner motion. Yeah. And you talked about that bicycle sales is growing continuously in a in an online fashion, sometimes referred to as direct to customer or direct to consumer. Yeah. How do you partner up with the let's call them e-commerce uh, platforms? Yeah, so what we see and realize is that uh, the aftermarket and service and support is a big pain point for e-commerce selling bicycles. If it was uh, selling shoes or anything, you sell the shoes and that's it. Uh, while with the bicycle, there is a lot of smaller issues all the time. And the first issue is starting when uh, you buy a bicycle and you get it home in a box and, and, and you need to assemble it. It's like an IKEA furniture. So you need to be a bit handy. You need to know what to do. There is fairly good instruction how to do it. But if you're not handy, things can go wrong. So a simple thing for you and me to mount a pair of paddles could be a disaster for anyone try to do it for the first time. So uh, we see that we can help the e-commerces by uh, introducing ourselves like a sample partner. So uh, when they buy a bicycle uh, from certain uh, e-commerces today, you can add on that you want to have it assembled by a bike buddy from Mio. Uh, the second step is the service and aftermarket issues. And if you buy a new bicycle and you want to keep it long lasting with a service protocol with anti-theft protection and everything, right. then you have the option to subscribe to Mio and we take away the pain points from the support department from those e-commerces and therefore we also create value for their customers to come back and buy the next bike from them because they think their experience is great. Exactly. So it's a win-win in a sense that you give back uh, to the bike seller as well. Can you give an example of one of your uh, partners perhaps in this motion? Yes, so uh, the partner that we've been uh, working with since 2021 20, is uh, Bikester here in Sweden. Yep. So uh, if you go to the Bikester web shop and you decide to buy a bicycle, then you can add on the the, the assembly uh, service. The assembly service. Exactly. So okay, so in summary you attach to online e-commerce sellers like Bikester yeah. and the like, and yeah. you obviously continue to look to expand. Yeah. There, one can, as a purchaser, can attach a service for uh, assembling the bike. Yes. And on top of that, there's the choice of going back to your main offering that we talked about before as a subscription, for example, you pay the thousand sec or a hundred euros a year yeah. with the bundles and the discounts and so on. Exactly. So uh, it's uh, exactly like buying a, a Apple uh, computer yeah. and you add on the care and support. Yes. I mean, if you think about it, when you when we speak about subscriptions business, bicycle lends itself extremely well for what some of us call like this forever relationship or transaction because ideally you buy a bicycle you want it to work for many many years yeah uh, but it is quite clear that for for many of us experience wise it's more something that doesn't well the experience hasn't been like that because you end up with a bicycle you the traditional customer support you go to the store that you bought it or which is much harder with an online seller, and you go, oh, this is not working, and get into this hassle, which is not at all a nice experience at all. So I see again here that beyond something fantastic for Mio, this is also something really, really good for the sellers of bicycles. Yeah. So I think this is a really, really nice value for them. And, and also to see the entire circle, circular economy, because, right. because if we go down to... Uh 
bicycle parking or uh, somewhere where, where your storage bicycles. Today, you can see that 40% of them uh, needs this kind of service. Yes. You, you see a lot of, if you're going down in my basement, for example, uh, there is a lot of bikes with dust and you have a front front wheel with uh, a front wheel puncture, with, yeah. which is fixed in five minutes. Yes, People are not doing it because it's not convenient to, to bring the bicycle to the bike shop for reason for that. And then if they want to catch up with cycling again, they most of the time just buy a new bike instead of fixing their bike that is fairly good to ride on a few years more. Is that an opportunity you're currently looking into? Like this ocean of abandoned bicycles, we can call them? Uh, more more of trying to fix the, the bikes that are in good shape, but they need this service. So uh, uh, it, it's a lot of times when, when you meet people and they can say that, okay, I have a bike, but it's not working at the moment. And uh, so we want people to know that we are there to come and help them at their doorstep to start riding the bike again, uh, not, not hesitating, uh, not the option to buy a new bike, but rather uh, use the bike that is there and just need to pump the tires and it's yeah, working. Yeah, which is your point about whether circular economy in terms of reusing it for something else or just making sure that you can extend the life of your bicycle because at some point we all, you know, there's a lot of conversations around sustainability and becoming, let's say, more smart and efficient with how we consume products at the end of the day, it comes down to something like this. Fix your bike, make sure that it holds and works instead of going buying something new. Exactly. I, I, I like that approach. Let's talk a bit more about the challenges now because it's quite clear. There's a huge opportunity. You've had a great journey so far. Perhaps I should ask first, uh, what markets do you operate in? At the, at the moment, we are operating in Sweden with focus on Stockholm, and then we have some services uh, running in Gothenburg and Malmö. Uh, we opened up Mio in London a few, one and a half year ago. Uh, we have uh, 2,000 customers already in London, mm -hmm. but we didn't have uh, the profit so we could sustain the business when we had some tougher times and tougher challenges to um, to uh, face uh, at the moment. Uh, we actually signed a partner agreement with Amazon for the UK, uh, but at, at the moment we are taking it easy there. We also uh, managed to make a partnership in Germany with one of the larger e-commerces there, but at the same at the same situation, at, at the moment, we need to uh, to develop the offering, focusing on Sweden, uh, being patient, wait for the next time when we can add uh, decent funding to expand the business uh, to new markets. But the pro product is ready. We are ready to expand, but it's more a question of uh, having uh, the willingness to invest and to uh, to uh, go for it, I would say. And uh, in the meantime, we are just staying patient and uh, improving our business here in Sweden, which is not bad because uh, we have still a lot of things to improve and things that we want to create in the app and so and so. So uh, I think it's at the same time, it's good that we can have a few years now when we can really focus on uh, uh, developing the business, developing uh, features in the app and then we are ready to conquer the world. So you have two really strong markets that you've tested outside of Sweden because London invests enormously in terms of its transportation and spe specifically into bicycle as a means because everybody who's been to London yeah. knows that it's, it's um, to say that it is congested would be to make uh, this year's understated comment. Yes. So there's a lot of investments there and then you've done the same in, in Germany. So you you have some tests, you have the foundation, yep. but then when you speak about the challenges to be um, a bit more clear on this, is it's mostly related to the economical downturn and the fact that it's suddenly become a bit more challenging 
also for consumers to spend. So this is why you're waiting for the timing, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So now we are focusing more on being self-sufficient, yes. make the business uh, showing uh, uh, the numbers that we are profitable within our markets here. And then uh, hopefully in a few years when everything uh, goes a bit better again, then we are ready to... to uh, put in the super growth again and, and expand me you. Gotcha. So coming back uh, to the question I popped uh, a minute ago or two, which are the challenges of running a subscriptions business, what would you say are your main challenges that you've experienced so far of running a subscriptions business is the question? Uh, for us, I would say that uh, since our subscription is not used on a daily basis, like if we take a company like Spotify and Netflix, which you use every day, it's uh, obviously that it should be a subscription based service. While Miu is more kind of an insurance at the moment where you use our service um, one or a few times per year when something happens. And uh, the thing that we're working on is to attract uh, to, to build more relevant services for people to use on a daily basis or a weekly basis. Uh, and, and also at the same time as we are working as an insurance, is, it's a lot about building um, trust with the customers. So, uh, for example, if your bike breaks down and you go to the bike shop and you can see that every time you go there, it's uh, two time two weeks of waiting time, uh, th then suddenly you see that, okay, if I sign up to me, you become a Mio subscriber, then I always have my bike rolling. So I would say the, the solution of our challenge is both to stay patient, building trust with the customer, but then at the same time also make more relevant features in the app that the user can use on a daily or weekly basis. Yeah. I think it's very consistent with what we've said before because the second point you raised is more you need to deliver on the promise that you have made with your current offering. And as we stated, there's already a pretty rich and complex offering in itself in the way that there's a subscription at the base, you've bundled in value for the customer with two-time service. You can get, uh, let's say, immediate help if you want to book yeah. more for more complex uh, maintenance needs at a store discounts for the maintenance parts. So all of that is already baked in. Let's not forget the actual insurance for theft. But I understand because your main challenge is that it's still one of those things in one of those things, let me rephrase. It's still one uh, of a situation where you have an issue is where you bring up the Mio app and you go, now I need Mio because I have a problem with my bike. So what you essentially need to do, you need to continuously enrich your offering. Yeah to get more into a recurrent, let's say, engagement with your customer. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I understand. How do you measure and track success? At the moment, uh, as I said, we are focusing a lot on uh, making the business profitable. So like key metrics for us at the moment are cash flow and uh, revenues, stuff like that. But then, of course, also we are measuring uh, um, customer acquisition costs, uh, retention of customers, uh, churn, obviously. So uh, um, we, we have set up the dashboard so we can follow up all those uh, KPIs on a regular basis. And then uh, we try to steer the company in the best direction what gives us best um, money value for for uh, for your investments exactly? For our, yes. Do you track the usage of your customers? Uh, of course, of course. Yeah. So I want to ask you how you use customers' usage and behavior to inform your decisions because. The beauty of a subscriptions business is that it lends itself to this, meaning you can track my usage of your service and how I behave on and off to inform your next steps and decisions because I think that you are 
onto something important, meaning that your service today is one of a, I use it when I need it. Expand on it. Yeah. Yo, so you are completely right. So uh, currently we are tracking the usage of uh, wh when you're booking a service or when you need help or support, of course. Uh, but ob obviously, like you said, we want to engage with the customer more often. So what we are looking into is that uh, if uh, we can set up uh, a gamification around uh, using the bike more often, and we can start tracking that. We can uh, both uh, be able to give the benefits to the users who use the bikes more often. And we can also uh, create a lot of data, see heat maps, how uh, people are moving around in a city. Like today, there is uh, Strava that is uh, currently tracking people for how to use the bikes uh, for a sport reason, mostly. Uh, the problem with that data, if we are looking into helping a city like Stockholm to build better infrastructure, is that uh, the data is from when people are having um, using their sport bike right. and not uh, going with their kids to school, for example. So what we want to do is like um, uh, having a Strava for for uh, bicycle commuters uh, and also give them uh, benefits for, for using the, the bikes more often. I think that's a brilliant idea. I use Strava a little bit um, and I completely understand your point. Strava actually delivers reports on an annual basis, I believe, to kind of provide some information for municipalities of how much, um, let's say, cycling is used in their respective cities and which roads that are mostly trafficked. So I think you're onto something important, but the, obviously the gap here is that it's not necessarily done for commuters. And since your service is primarily attached to the daily habit and usage of bicycles, yes. commuting, I think that's a brilliant idea. And just to kind of wrap, uh, up the question about usage you are tracking usage to the extent of how your service is being used which is yeah. why you are learning that okay it's we need to find other ways of sticking to our customers and creating more value for them which is then bridging to this idea that you have exciting thomas i think you know again the foundation of your service is extremely good um, and uh, it's again when listening to your line of thinking it's quite clear how customer centric you are, albeit it's a worn out term. Everybody says they're customer centric, but just kudos to you and the team because you live up to that mentality. Yeah, thanks. My final question to you, Thomas, what advice do you have for anybody who wants to embark on a journey of providing subscription-based services? I would say first, first of all, you need to find a strong need how to help and contribute to the customers. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, you need to make a, a really strong package, bundle things that are relevant for the customers. Like we've been test tested out a few things on our journey and see what fits in this subscription and which is not. And then the third thing uh, would be the journey that we are doing right now to engage uh, customers on a more regular basis, um, I would say. Thank you so much, Thomas. I really appreciate your time and thank you everybody else for listening in today. Thanks.